so much. I don't, my co this is my cousin, you know. We are related. We are. And I never, ever thought that we would be sitting on a bimmer together and talking to a whole lot of gay yids. Amazing. <laughs> <laughs> There may be some straight people in here because we're very broad-minded. Well, I approve of that. Yes. I don't like separation. That's the one thing <laughs> I don't want. So I'm going to begin, Miriam, if I yeah. may, by reminding you the first time we ever spoke. So in 1988, I was sitting at my desk in New York where I was then living, and the phone rang, and I picked up the phone, and this... Um, very cultured English voice said, is that Roderick Young? And I said, yes. And this person said, this is Miriam Margulies, and I've been told that we're cousins, and I've been told to call you by our mutual cousin, David Samuelson, because apparently you know all about the family. So I told Miriam everything that I knew, we chatted away, and I'm a bit dim sometimes, and kind of hadn't clocked whom I was talking to. And I said in my best manner as the late queen at one point, and what do you do? <laughs> and there was a slight pause, and she said, well, I'm an actor. I and didn't I, say that. No, you said actress. I always say actress. Yes, yes. I'm an actress. And I paused, and I went, oh, oh, are you the Miriam Margulies? <laughs> And she said, well, I rather suppose I am. <laughs> so my first question to you this evening is, you're so interested in genealogy, and probably half the people in this room are your cousins. <laughs> because you have cousins everywhere. What is it about genealogy? It's connection. It's being connected to people. And it would be wonderful if I were related to more people here. I would be thrilled to bits, actually. And I hope that all of you are tracing your families and finding out where you came from. Because who they were is part of who you are. And I think it's thrilling to, to find out. I, I started because of a, another cousin, now, now dead, Selwyn Torrance, originally Turiansky. That's always the thing you have to ask, isn't it? But what was it before? What was your name before? And that famous joke about Sean Ferguson. Do you know that one? Well, I'm sure you all do. It's a bit I'm embarrassing sure some to tell it. Don't. tell it. Oh, well, I, uh, somebody said to um, a chap, who, who, a Jewish chap, and, and said, Sean Ferguson, that's, that's not a, a very Jewish name. And he said, well, it's... It, it, I shouldn't forget what the other one was. I don't know. <laughs> um, <laughs> but it, it's... Um, I, I just love finding out being a detective in history. And the main thing I have to say to you tonight is right on the back of the photographs. Right on the back of all those photographs that you've got at home, in boxes, in envelopes, in cupboards, at the bottom of of trunks, right on the back. Put the names, because otherwise we, you'll be gone and we'll never know. And people have a right to be remembered. So who is the most eccentric cousin that you've managed to uncover? <laughs> I think probably my great-grandfather, the criminal. He, he was uh, Simon... Sandman with two N's. My mother's name was Sandman, Ruth Sandman, and he was Simon Sandman. And he came to England, I suppose, in something like 1850, I think. And um, he was eventually imprisoned for fraud, a Jewish crime. Uh, <laughs> and um, given a very heavy anti-Semitic sentence of seven years, hard labor in Parkhurst, Isle of Wight. They lived in, in Brick Lane. They lived an, in Yorkshire, and they arrived, actually, in um, the Northeast, in um, 
Newcastle. And um, I have got lots of relatives up there too. But it's just so fascinating. And I, I feel very affectionate towards this chap, even though he was a crim. Um, <laughs> and I have a photograph of him that he sent. When he was released from jail, he went to South Africa, where his two daughters had settled. And he sent back a photo to all the family of a man in an astrakhan coat with a fur hat and a diamond tie pin. And it was to show that now I am, I am me and I am out of prison and I have made it and I have money and I'm a citizen. And it's very touching, mm. I think. So if you want to know more about Miriam's family, and she hasn't bribed me to do this, oh. if you haven't read this, it's available in all the best bookstores. <laughs> And it is a wonderful read, it really is. Well, your rabbi said it was very rude, you told me. And it is very rude, it is. There no. are words that some of the people here may not know. But, um... Miriam, no one ever thinks of you as rude. We think of you as, as, as decorum itself. I think that it doesn't matter if you say potty mouth things. It, what matters is what you do. Absolutely. That's what matters. So I get really cross that people give me a bad time and they let these criminals in Parliament, like Raab and Rishi, you know, these are people, and, and Boris Johnson, these are, these are people who ought to be in Parkhurst. That's what, that's what I think. I'll tell you a little family secret here. She doesn't normally call him Boris Johnson, and I hope she's not going to say what no, she normally I won't. does. I'm very mindful that it's Shabbat, and I don't, want, <laughs> I don't want to offend people, which is not what people think of me. They think I'm always offending people, but I don't want to do that. I just like to tell it as it is. Absolutely. That's, that's what I like to do. So, what I want to know is since we're sitting in a synagogue, when you were a child in Oxford, did you used to go to synagogue? Did your family take you? Was that part of what it was like growing up as young Miriam? We were three times a year Jews. Uh, my father was a doctor in Oxford, and we belonged to the shul there, which was a rather grim place in a, in a tough area of Oxford. Now it's very posh and rather gorgeous, but it wasn't then. And there were a lot of refugees from the East End, who'd been bombed out, like my parents, and a lot of people from Europe also. And because my father was one of the, I think, the only doctor in, in Oxford who spoke Yiddish, <laughs> we, we had quite a big Yiddish-speaking clientele, and that was interesting for me. I remember seeing on their arms the, the branding of the concentration camps and asking, what is that? And nobody really said, because it was too raw and painful a subject, and they felt perhaps that a child shouldn't have to deal with that. But I was born in 1941 in the shadow of the Holocaust. And I don't think it's ever left me. I don't think it's left any of us, actually. I think any, any Jew, whatever their position religiously, you are aware of what happened, and you never forget it. And I, I never can, I never want to, but it's a powerful memory for me, and it's a powerful presence in my life. Mm. And yesterday was Hitler's birthday, and thank God he's not here. Mm. But there are people who inherited what he what he said and did. And we have to be ever watchful, ever careful. You do. I think so. So you're very open about not being religious, but you're very culturally Jewish, aren't you? Well, yes, because it's a wonderful culture. Hmm. I mean, how could anything be more wonderful than chopped liver? <laughs> <laughs> and I'm nearly vegetarian, but chopped liver. I, it's, it's exquisite, and that's part of culture, and then there's all the rest, the poetry, the music, the jokes, and 
I, I think that we're very lucky to be Jewish. I feel sorry for the Goyim, actually. <laughs> As I tell them quite often, <laughs> to their intense irritation. And, you know, where you are tonight, you are in the oldest... I'm going to get the name wrong. I keep getting it wrong. The oldest LGBTQ plus Jewish group in the world. This is the first established, as far as we know. So you're in this venerable, this fantastic group. And what I want to ask you is, as a Jewish person who's also lesbian, God, I haven't doubted you, have I? I doubt it. <laughs> so when did you come out? I don't think I was ever in. Um, <laughs> uh, I, I honestly don't. I mean, when I, I didn't know I, that there was such a thing until I probably was at university. Um, but I, I just did what I wanted to do. And I've always been like that. So I've never really suffered from being gay. Um, and I'm very conscious that many people have, but I didn't. I didn't. I just did what I wanted to do. And I remember in the, probably the late 60s, there was a group that I belonged to called Gay Yids. Oh, really? Yes. We had a badge. There's and not I any... wore it at the BBC where I was working there. <laughs> there isn't anyone else here who might have been a member of that? Oh, wow! Am I, I'm telling the truth, aren't I? Yes. So tell us your name. Carol. Hi, Carol. Were you in the same group with Miriam? Gay well, it, it was just in... You were in Lancaster, were you? Oh, well, uh, this one was in North London. Um, and um, I remember going to the meetings and, and talking to people and having meetings in my house. And I actually was able to introduce two, two boys who got married. Two South Africans, Saul Radomsky and Oded Schwartz. So they're lovely, both dead now, alas. But it was such a happy thing to, to be able to be the, 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 the... What do you call them? The, the Shadchan. The Shadchan. The Shadchan. I was a real-life Shadchan. And I was only about 20. <laughs> so, <laughs> 22, probably. So you say you never had any um, homophobia. But you, I've heard you talk and you've told me personally about the sexism that you suffered in the footlights. <coughs> oh, yeah, there was Cambridge. misogyny, and there yeah. still is, absolutely. Yeah. Yes, the, these minor public school boys, um, they, they, they went in for that sort of thing, um, and it was horrible, and it still is. But, you know, that's what they're like. They don't know any better. Because I was very shocked. I remember you telling me, you know, I, I, I'm of an age, I'm 63, where I idealised Monty Python and them all. And you said, well, they weren't very nice to you No, at uni. they were shits. They were horrible. Right. They were small-minded and they were jealous. They didn't, they didn't celebrate other people's talent. And you have to celebrate other people's talent. It's absolutely essential. You mustn't try and lessen other people's talent. You should glorify it and, and increase it. And they, would, they really didn't like me, and um, they sent me to Coventry. I'm, I've written about it very, very fully in my, in my book, which is in paperback form now. It's only 10 quid. <laughs> <laughs> 10 quid in Tesco's. <laughs> I will sign it if you, if you wish. I hope it's 15 quid in Waitrose. No, <laughs> I'm afraid not. There was an error there, clearly. <laughs> but didn't, didn't you once say that, um, was it Graham Chapman who later apologised to you? It was Tim Brooke Taylor. Oh, Tim Brooke Taylor. Who was a, right. actually a lovely guy, very sweet. Funnily enough, last night I was doing a very similar sort of talk with Graham Garden, oh. who was one of the goodies, who was lovely. He was a lovely boy. Goodies, goody, goody. How Is that how went? it went? Yes. <laughs> um, and I hadn't seen him for about, I don't know, 20 years or something. It was very, very nice to see him. Um, it was in Chipping Norton, which is a pretty town in Oxfordshire, where all these Tories live. <laughs> and I told them, don't you do it again. <laughs> I told them off. <laughs> it was a wonderful opportunity to do so. <laughs> 
Now, I have a question for you, and I think I'm representing all the middle-aged gay men in this room. Okay? Yep. I am now going to talk to you about God, by which, of course, I mean Barbara Streisand. <laughs> so, I remember many years ago, Miriam casually mentioning to me that she was in Yentl, and I nearly had... I nearly had a heart attack on the spot. And then, 10 years ago, she sent me a text saying she was just off to the United States to do a film. And I said, oh, what, what, what film is it? And she replied, oh, it's a, a movie with Barbara Streisand. So this is 10 years ago. And I texted back and I said, you don't just say to a gay man, oh, it's some movie with Barbara Streisand. <laughs> and then I said, Miriam, will you do me a favor? will you get me a lock of her hair? <laughs> and she sent me back a text, all capital letters, don't be so silly. <laughs> Did I? Yes. So, well, tell us about Barbara. There are really two Barbaras, and I don't know her that, that well. The first time I met her was when I read for a part in Yentl and it was in Wembley in the studios there. And she was lovely. She was sitting on a sofa with her kneeling, and with her legs under her and a little couple on her head, looking like a yeah, Jewish pixie, really. <laughs> and um, she's my age, so she's nearly 82. And she was enchanting and very interested in, in the people that she was interviewing, which was lovely, because most people are not. And I told her that I'd just been working with um, uh, Paul, oh gosh, what, this is what, what happens when you get old. Um, you know, the, the guy that married, um, uh, um, oh, I can't bear it when Warren this happens. Warren Beatty? Yeah, Warren. She was thrilled that I knew Warren, and I'd had a real run-in with him, because he's a naughty boy. <laughs> and um, I won't tell you the conversation, but it was fairly explicit. And um, she said, what's he like? What's he like? Now, I knew that they'd had an affair, so she knew what he was like. But, uh, and I did not have an affair with him, but he was, um, he was quite something. He was power-hungry. But he propositioned way. you, didn't he? He did. In, in very explicit terms. Um, and I said, uh, when he said, do you, do, uh, do you, the word is there, and I said, no, I don't, I'm a lesbian, and I, girls, <laughs> and, um, <laughs> never spoken quite like this, and uh, he said, uh, can I watch? <laughs> And I said, pull yourself together and get on with the interview. I got the part, however, which was good. But I told this all to Barbara Streisand, and she was fascinated. And um, we got on very well, and I got the part. And uh, I, I, it's not a big part in Yentl. It was fun. But, and we went out to Czechoslovakia, uh, to Prague. And she paid for all of us to go in a bus to Theresienstadt so that we could see that place where so many had died, which was now very sanitized and changed. But she felt, as I feel, it's very important to go to those places, even though it's awful. But I think we should remember, be aware. It's terrible. And she was very moved by it too. And one thing happened when we were making that movie they made the set of the village just outside Prague, and they bussed all the old Jews who were in Prague to come and be the extras, to be the villagers in the scenes that were shot there. And they made the village with just the frontages. Sometimes you can see that when a place has been um, picked to, to, to be a something that should remain, and the, the back of it is all modern, but the front has got to retain the facade. 
So the facades were all old village houses. There was the shul and the baker and, and all, but just the facade. And when they got out of the coach, all these old Jews coming from Prague, and they saw something they thought they would never see again, a, a shtetl in front of them. There it was, still there. And they were thrilled, and their faces lit up. And they walked towards these structures. And then they walked behind. And they saw there was nothing. It was just a facade. There were just slats of wood holding up the frontage. And then I think they knew they would never see them again. That was gone. That world that they'd grown up in and known and loved and been part of, they were the survivors. But the rest was ashes. And I really felt that moment. I've never forgotten it. So then I met Streisand again, 10 years ago. It was in a film called The Guilt Trip with Seth Rogen. And she had become Barbara Streisand. She was the great artist, the great star. And I think it's very dangerous when you start to believe your publicity. It's not a good thing. You should always retain humility. It's very important for your art, I think. And um, she wouldn't speak to people. She didn't talk to anyone. Uh, one of the actresses in the scene said, oh, Barbara, could I have a photo with you? I would be so delighted if I would. And she just said, no, no. And she didn't. And then she wouldn't do the lines, what we call the off lines, when the character is speaking to her. She doesn't have any lines, but you always are there. You must be present while the lines are being said. It's, it's courtesy to your colleagues. She wouldn't do that. She just went to her trailer. And so whoever was doing the lines just had to speak them to the air. And I think that's deeply wrong. Mm. So I'm critical of her in that way. Um, she was very pleasant to me. Um, but I, I lost my, my awe of her. I thought, you, you silly woman. <laughs> silly. Be generous whenever you can. Be generous. It doesn't cost anything to just have your photo taken, for goodness sake. So there we are. And if you want to have a really good laugh, if you look at the CD of that movie, Guilt Trip, there are outtakes. And there is one hilarious outtake of a certain Miriam Margulies sitting at a table after, it's not in the movie. It's I, you, I didn't know this. It's you sitting at a table. And how shall I say this and not be indelicate? Resting certain body parts upon the table. <laughs> Well, you and have to doing, give them a rest sometimes. And doing so very extravagantly, <laughs> and then making quite a song and dance of it in front of Streisand, and it is hilarious. I didn't know that. Oh, yes, it's very funny indeed. <laughs> you need to look there at that. Are. So, moving on then, one of the things that you've become... I mean, you, I, I couldn't possibly cover all your career, because you're, you're so famous for so many things. But I know that your life changed somewhat because of Harry Potter. So how is that experience that now you're recognized all over the world for being Professor Sprout? Do you enjoy that? Oh, of course I do. It's lovely. I mean, it's wonderful to, to be recognized and, and people are nice. You know, if they said, you know, you're a pile of shit, I wouldn't like it. But they don't. <laughs> they, they, they're just friendly and pleased. and. And I, I, I love telling this one, but when I was in Lithuania making a film, 
I, I went to, the, to a, a ballet in the afternoon in the theatre there, and the kids, it was full of kids, and they absolutely mobbed me. And when a Jew is mobbed in Lithuania, <laughs> <laughs> not always great, you know, but this was, this really was. And um, no, I, I'm deeply grateful to Harry Potter. I'm not interested in Harry Potter. I don't read it, I've never read it, I've never seen any of my films, because uh, I went to sleep, actually. And so <laughs> I'm not interested in science fiction and fantasy and all that kind of stuff. No, it's not interesting. But it was useful, because it made me better known. And so, of course, I'm very grateful. Mm. And you're very good, you're good friends with Dame Maggie Smith, yes? I'm not good friends with her because that would be impertinent. I like her very much. Mm. I think she's, oh, an ornament of our profession. I think she's an, an astonishing person and, and wonderful. And she went to my school. I actually well. said that because I hoped that you would do your wonderful oh, Dame yes, Maggie impersonation. I, I'll tell you this story about, <laughs> uh, uh, about Dame Maggie and me. Well, one day I got a phone call from the headmistress, the current headmistress of my school, the Oxford High School. And she said, Miriam, we've, uh, we've made a, a theater space in the new building, and we wondered if you would ask Maggie Smith if she would come and open <laughs> the building. <laughs> so I, I, I swallowed, and I said, um, well, of course I will. You know, I, I will ask her. Uh, and, and I did. Next time I saw her, I, it was probably at a do somewhere. Um, and I said, um, Maggie, I had a phone call from, from the high school, and they would love you to come and open the new buildings. And there's a theater space which is de dedicated to you. And it, it would be just marvelous for them. They're really hoping that you will. And she looked at me with that frosty look. <laughs> slightly lip curling and I said would you go to Oxford and open their building and have that space dedicated to you and she said no <laughs> no I won't I hated the school <laughs> it was very snobbish and I didn't like it at all and she looked at me with a sort of naughty grin, and she said, you'd like to, wouldn't you? <laughs> and I said, well, <laughs> why don't you do it? You tell them you want to do it. I'm not going. <laughs> and so the, the headmistress rang me back, and um, I said, look, I'm awfully sorry, but Maggie wasn't really happy at the school, and she thinks it would be not right to come, so she has declined. And there was a sort of awkward pause. <laughs> <laughs> and obviously, I wasn't going to say anything. I thought, well, you know, we'll just... And then, after a moment, she said, well, Miriam, would you, would you like to... Uh, would you be prepared to come in, in instead? And I said, I'd be thrilled to come. It would be absolutely wonderful for me. I would adore it. And it was wonderful for me. It was one of the most glorious moments of my life, actually, because my school mattered to me, and it was a wonderful school. And they were, it, it just, it was an incredible moment. And I stood in the school hall, and I talked to the assembled pupils there. And then they took me to the Miriam Margulies Theatre Studio. Oh. And there it was. <laughs> and, you know, I mean, Maggie should have a theatre named after her. And so should Judy. And so should Eileen Atkins. Theatres should be named after actors and writers. But um, not people who happen to be the the head of the board of governors, like the Cottesloe, I mean, should be a, a Lillian Bayliss should have a theatre named after her. 
but I've got a little studio space in Oxford, and I'm thrilled. <laughs> <laughs> so you're in liberal Jewish synagogue here. Yes. And liberal Judaism, reform Judaism, one of the things that uh, really motivated them at the beginning was the idea of prophetic Judaism. So you look at the prophets, and the prophets saying how people should be treated. And I always think about you as being in that kind of... Um, in that kind of thinking of prophetic Judaism, because you're so, you're so energetic and so um, full of the desire that this world should be a better place. What gives you that fire in your belly that makes you want to campaign, as you do, and be so outspoken? I don't know the answer to that. I think it's something in my character, in my nature, in who I am, and also because I had wonderful parents. And the thing about mummy and daddy was that they gave me so much love. They loved me so much. They gave me whatever they could to make my life better. And I feel confident about myself because of that. And so I expect to be loved. I expect people to be nice to me, and I'm always astonished when they're not. But it made me want to do things for other people, because when you receive a lot, you want to give a lot. And, I, and that's what I want. I want the world to be better. It couldn't be much bloody worse, could it? <laughs> God, my, it's shocking. The things people do and say to each other now, the divisions, the cruelty, I absolutely hate it. And I, I can't help it. And, I, and people are always telling me to shut up. From the very beginning, I was told to shut up, but I, I won't. I can't. If I see an injustice, I have to speak out. And I think that's actually a very Jewish thing. It is. Um, liberal Judaism is very strange to me. It's very strange to, to sit in, in, in Ikea like this. Um, <laughs> it, it's, it's sort of... <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it, it is, it's Scandinavian, it's, it's, it's amazing. It's, it's, very, it, it's very nice, I like it, I like what I look at. But it, I don't respond emotionally to this because this wasn't my tradition. My tradition was the Orthodox tradition. And my father, you know, spoke Hebrew and, and uh, the shul we went to in Oxford, it was a lousy little shul, but it was an orthodox shul, and that's what I was used to. We had a, a ladies' bit upstairs, and even when I joined the orthodox shul in Clapham, because there was a shul in Clapham, believe it or not, um, there was a ladies' department upstairs, and the hats were what I remember there. <laughs> it wasn't so much the sermons or anything like that, but the hats, they were amazing. Um, because South London, believe it or not, exists. I know you don't believe it, but it does. <laughs> and it's where I live still. And there are lots of Jewish people in South London. There's particularly Wimbledon and Kingston. There's huge communities there. And... Um, I, it, I feel a bit nervous when I come to North London, actually. It sort of feels... Well, as you probably do when you cross the river. But You're assuming everyone here is from North London. I bet there are some South Londoners here. Yeah. Oh, my there you go. How lovely. <laughs> I can give you lifts home if you want. <laughs> <laughs> How do, nice. Do you mind if I open it up and ask if there are people who'd like to ask you questions? Oh, of course, of course. I'd love that. Oh, there's a gentleman here who's straight out Hello. of the... And there might have been a gospel question, so you can tell me to my mind if you like. Where do you come from? I live in Peckham. We actually That's... have an email exchange about your family in Peckham. Yeah, because well. my mother, I was going to say, my mother had a shop in Peckham, Madame Flora. <laughs> and um, I know I love Peckham. I think it's fabulous. There it is a, lovely. There was a pub on the corner uh, called The Grove in, in um, Dulwich, because they moved to Dulwich afterwards. And it's near Underhill Road, where they lived. 
I do know Underhill Road, but what I wanted to ask you yes, sorry, was sorry. Uh, many years ago when I read Maureen Lipman's books, she talks about you a great deal and you obviously had a very good friendship. I didn't know she, there, Yeah, there's whole chapters about you. But, um, well, whole paragraphs, whole paragraphs, I shouldn't say chapters. But in your book, when you talk about Maureen, all you said was, when we were friends. And well, I just wondered what happened. We're not friends anymore, and it's a pity, because I, I'm always sad when friendship ends. But um, it's about Israel. Um, Maureen is, is a Zionist and passionately believes in the existence of Israel and the continuance of Israel, and she won't hear a word of criticism against Israel. And I'm afraid I can't go along with that because I don't feel like that. I mean, yes, I've been to Israel lots of times, and I, I was on a kibbutz, and I, I was, I wasn't ever a Zionist, I don't think, but I, I was there, and I, I want it to survive. Of course, I do, but. I have to criticize it, and particularly now, I have to criticize it. And I want Jewish people to go to Palestine and just see for themselves what's going on. That's what I would like to happen. But that is the reason that Maureen and I are no longer friends. And I'm very sorry about it, because she is a, a gifted performer. But I will say this, when she was uh, made a dame, I wrote to her my congratulations, and I said, if only Zelma were alive to know this, because she had a, a wonderful mother, amazing woman, and it would have made her quell. <laughs> and I knew that, and I, I wanted to say that to, to Maureen, and I did. And I think she was very pleased that I did. Who knows, we may, we may come back together again. But I absolutely admire her as an artist, but I cannot be with her over her as Zionism. More questions? There's a lady here. Yes. Thanks. Hi. Hello. Um, my name's Jenna. It's nice to meet you. Um, I was wondering if you have a favorite piece of media or film book um, that's about Jewish people. Like a film or a play that specifically. A film or a play that's about Jewish people. Yeah. And if you have a favourite one, one that really resonates with you. Um, well, I do. I'm fascinated by George Eliot's book, Daniel Deronda. It's um, a long and difficult book, and she was not Jewish, of course. But she was enormously sympathetic to Jewish people at a time when that was very unusual. So I think that would probably count as, as one of my favorites. But I don't, I don't think about separating Jews or gays. I mean, I want us all to be one, one hu human mass of people who can interconnect and love across all barriers. That's, that's what should happen. And that's what you are able to do in a, in a liberal shul, which is a wonderful thing. Because I know when I was in my Clapham synagogue, which later went to Brixton and became um, Liam Court Road, the, the synagogue there, I know they found me very difficult to cope with. They didn't know what to do. <laughs> I mean, you know, a, a, a lesbian non-Zionist and fat into the bargain. <laughs> I, I, I was a bit of a trouble to them. I liked them very much, and they were, they were nice to me, but they were nervous. <laughs> Another question. There's a, a woman on the second row here. Hello. Um, Hello. I'd just like to know what it was like filming Call the Midwife. Oh, it was magical. I loved everything about that. Because um, Jenny Agatha, who is a, a brilliant actress and an absolutely wonderful mother of the company, she's a sweetheart and welcomes everybody who comes new to the cast. And I had just the most wonderful time. And I, I may well go back to it. 
It was, it was lovely, and all the people were... I just didn't like the children like that. <laughs> That's the thing. I can't bear kids. Um, I just can't be doing with them. And um, I had to act with them and work with them. <laughs> Funnily enough, I had to do that in, in, in Harry Potter as well. But they were sort of older in Harry Potter. They weren't babies. And I, babies, really, I, I just can't be doing with it. Um, <laughs> so uh, that part of it was a little bit difficult. But I loved everything else. And I think, they are, I think it's a wonderful program. Uh, and I, you know, I wish everything was as good as that. No, I loved it. We had some... Russell. Um, you, you mentioned Israel sort of en passant, um, but being sort of Jewish LGBT uh, evening tonight, um, I'm sort of aware that Israel is probably the only country in the Middle East that is sort of pro-gay and has gay marriages, lesbian marriages. Um, and um, I remember there was a, an article from someone in Gaza who was gay, a, a Palestinian, who said he would rather be um, a Jew in Gaza than gay because of the oppression he was suffering in Gaza. So I just wondered what your thoughts are on the Middle East and, and sort of gayness in general in that area. Well, I think it's awful. I, I hate it when people are, are ridiculously prejudiced against homosexuals. It's just absurd. And I'm sure many Muslims think so too. We, I, I can't lump them all together. You know, some, some I, don't, I, I don't know a, a lot of Arab countries. I, I haven't been to many Arab countries. And I don't talk about that sort of thing. Well, you know, it's funny. All the things you want to talk about, you can't. You want to talk about sex, religion, politics, and money. And, and, and you're not supposed to talk about any of those things. I mean, what? <laughs> Ridiculous. Whenever I, I go to the shul in Glasgow, the lovely um, one in the center of, of Garnet Hill, it's a beautiful shul, and they always say to me, oh, Miriam, don't, uh, don't be controversial. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, <laughs> tough shit. <laughs> that's, that's, that's who I am. Um, I, I can't say anything particularly intelligent about uh, Muslims who are anti-gay. Uh, they are wrong. That's all I will say. And one day they'll realize it. It's just stupid. There was a gentleman in the green mask there who's had his hand up for some time. Up who? Up. <laughs> up. 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 Hello. Um, Hello. I loved your series you did uh, five years ago about Trump land. When you go into the hinterland in the US and interview right wing Americans and yeah. how you learn to find a way of empathizing, even though you disagreed with everything they, they believed. And I, I wondered if you would ever do a, a series like that about the UK, because I think we have so many divisions and weird strands running through our country right now, and it needs someone like you who can cut through all of the BS and <laughs> actually ask people some interesting questions. Well, I would like to do uh, a series in England like that, but I don't know if, if anybody will ask me to. We'll see. I mean, you know, I'm not, unfortunately, Joanna Lumley, who is very beautiful, very elegant, very intelligent, and a thoroughly nice person, by the way. Um, and she's probably cornered the market in that sort of thing in England. So I wander around the rest of the world. But I would like to do it in Israel. I'd like to go to Israel and to Palestine and talk to people there. Because it's only by talking to people, getting to know them, asking questions, and not accepting rubbish, just probing, that you get to the heart of things and, and manage to cross the bridges and the chasms that divide us. And that's what I want to do. I think I've got a very good face. 
I've got a friendly, open face. And when people look at me, they're not afraid. They know that I will listen and that I care what they say. And that is a plus. And I don't know of many interviewers like me who are so human as I am. They are cleverer. They are wiser. But they're not friendlier. So maybe it will happen. Maybe. I mean, I hope it's soon, because I'm going to be 82. And I'm going in for a, a heart operation in May. I've, I've got to have a stent. I, has anybody ever had one of those? A stent. It's something that, that goes up your groin, up underneath into the heart, and goes pop and opens, opens the valve that's narrow. So if I survive that, I'll, um, I'll be back for more. You know, that's what I hope. I know we have more questions, but unfortunately, um, the food is out. Hooray! So, <laughs> <laughs> so I've been told that uh, Miriam and I could talk forever. We're both horribly talkative people. Uh, Rabbi Alexander is here. Well, can I just say, you on can. behalf of all of us here, the LGBT plus group, the LJS as well, thank you so much. Can I say my father's got eight stents and he's eight, 95. Oh, that's wonderful news. So but, well, that's the first thing I wanted to say to you. I hope that reassures you. Secondly, I wanted to say I think you make a wonderful Jewish mother Mildred and I'm a complete <laughs> do devotee of Call the Midwife. And because of what you just said about being loved, you have made all of us here feel so much better this evening and so much loved as well. So I want to say thank you so much for being with us here. Thank you, Rabbi Roderick, for engaging Miriam in a wonderful conversation. A very small thank you from, oh, from thank us. You. And please... Thank you so much, Miriam. Apologies to everyone who didn't get to uh, ask a question. Um, but we're going in there, and we but can. We're, have, we're going in there, and we can carry on talking. Can come and talk. Yes. Um, uh, um, as you heard before, um, Miriam is going into hospital, and so we're going to ask you to to give her a little bit of space because she doesn't want to catch any nasty bugs uh, before she goes into hospital. But she's very happy to carry on talking. So. You bet. We hope to see you next door. And um, we don't have time, but I was going to ask her to tell my favorite story, but I'm not going to now. I'm going to tell you to look it up. When Miriam was invited to a, a, a garden party by the late queen, it is a hilarious story. So look it up. It's on YouTube on Graham Norton. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you, Miriam. my darling. Thank you.